welcome to the truth show in this video i will be talking about the true history of little mermaid you'll be surprised by the history with that said let's get started This is a trigger warning in this video I may be talking about or showing sensitive material about some subjects or topics that may be disturbing or upsetting or may bring forth some troubling memories as you read in the description or title. With that said, either in the video now or brace yourself. Aside from that, enjoy. Now before I go deep about The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen, it's a fairy tale about a mermaid who falls in love with a human. The plot of Anderson's fairy tale is set in the motion when the Little Mermaid visits the surface of the sea to observe life on land. Another clue, by the way. This is a privilege afforded to mermaids once a year after the age of 15. Oh yes. The original story of the Little Mermaid is markedly different from the popular Disney ad adaptation most audiences know. Anderson's original story is at the bottom of the sea, where six mermaid sisters live with their father, the Sea King. The youngest of the Sea King's daughters is the protagonist of Anderson's tale, the Little Mermaid. The Sea King is a widower and is presumably busy running his underwater kingdom. Oh yes. So his mother watches over the six mermaid sisters. The Little Mermaid's grandmother informs her that when she turns 15, she will be able to visit the sea surface and observe life on land. When the Little Mermaid visits the surface of the sea, she observes a birthday party for a handsome prince who becomes the story's main love interest. Oh yes. A nasty storm rolls in and sinks the prince's ship. The Little Mermaid rescues the prince from drowning and delivers him to the temple where some human girls restore the prince. The Little Mermaid returns to her home under the sea without the prince ever realizing it was she who saved him. The Little Mermaid's infatuation with the prince leads her to ask her grandmother about the nature of humanity. The grandmother tells the Little Mermaid that humans live a much shorter time than 300 years typical of mermaids life but have immortal souls, which mermaids lacked. Another clue. The Little Mermaid expresses her desire to live as a human to her grandmother, who tells her, the young mermaid, that the thought is foolish because mermaids can only gain a soul through marriage with a human. The Little Mermaid decides she would do anything to be with her prince, so she visits the Sea Witch. The Sea Witch says she will give the Little Mermaid a potion to drink that would turn her fishtail into human legs, so the mermaid can be among humans. But there's the catch. The legs the Little Mermaid will gain from the potion will hurt every time she walks. Additionally, the Little Mermaid will not gain an immortal soul unless she marries the prince. If she fails to marry the prince, she would die and become a sea foam. The Little Mermaid chances it for love and accepts the potion from the Sea Witch. In exchange for the potion, the Sea Witch takes the Little Mermaid's voice. The Little Mermaid surfaces to drink the potion and when she does she falls unconscious when the little mermaid awakes she finds the sea witch potion has worked the prince finds the little mermaid and takes charge of her the prince takes a liking to the little mermaid but does not love her the prince relates that his love is reserved for the girl who rescued him from his shipwreck the little mermaid is mute because of the sea witch's potion and cannot inform the prince that she saved him the prince presumes the girl that restored him at the temple saved him from the shipwreck. The prince is forced into an arranged marriage that he, that he willfully accepts once he learns that the girl in the arrangement is the one from the temple he believes saved him. The little mermaid realizes that her failure to marry the prince means her death. The little mermaid is heartbroken but is comforted by her sisters who appear above water with a magical dagger they have received from the sea. Which in exchange for their hair. 
the little mermaid takes the blade and they and they tell her she must kill the prince and have his blood touch her feet to become a mermaid again the little mermaid goes to murder the prince but cannot bring herself to kill her beloved the little mermaid throws the dagger and herself into the sea which she transforms into a sea foam upon being transformed into foam the little mermaid is lifted into the air and informed that she might join the daughters of the air other mermaid spirits in pursuit of an immortal soul the little mermaid learns that if she performs 300 years of good deeds for humanity she will be rewarded with an immortal soul now that we got that out of the way let's go back in time <laughs> tales of mermaids have been spoken about since humanity learned how to write but how and when did their stories and the possibility of their existence spring up where did they originate did they come from sailors, tales of sightings, or were they known even before that? Mermaids appear in the folklore of many countries, most prominent in Asia, Africa, Europe. But where did the information about these creatures first appear? The first mermaid's account was found in 1000 BC in Assyria, known as Syria today. In the mythical telling of Assyria, the beautiful goddess of fertility, a targetess, cast herself into a lake and transformed into a mermaid. Oh, yes. But tell is not enough to so heavily imagine and spread the word about mermaids lurking in the seas and waiting for ships to sail above them. Word has it that sailors from centuries ago have claimed to spot them. Oh, yes. Christopher Columbus was one of them, although historians argue that what he could have seen could have been sea animals. But the face of an animal and the face of a human couldn't be more different. I mean, I'm just saying. So did he mistake them for sea animals? Nobody knows the answer to that. But Columbus was an explorer, among other things. And there might have been things he saw that have still yet to be explained. Famous pirates like Blackbeard had marked certain parts of the seas as enchanted on his logbook and instructed his ship crew to stay clear of these waters for fear of mermaids and sirens. Mm -hmm. It's true. Every culture has its version of the Little Mermaid. But the famous American version is based on areas that were and still are habitated with Negroes, Blacks, Hispanics, Africans, so on. For example, her six older sisters and Ariel represents the seven seas. Did you know that? Athena, the firstborn daughter's name is Athena, the firstborn daughter of King Triton and Queen Athena, thus making her the future queen of Atlantica. She represents the Bering Sea. Mm -hmm. Alana, the secondborn sister, she is the glamorous sister who makes her beauty products. She represents the Black Sea, hence the color of her hair. Adela, the third sister. Adela is the only other mermaid princess whose tail doesn't match her she bra. In the TV series, she's portrayed to be curvier and plumper than her sisters. But in the rest of the media, she's just as slim as the other sisters. She is a flirty and boy crazy sister. She represents the Mediterranean Sea. Aquita, the fourth sister. Aquita is known for having a seahorse doll named Mr. Fuzzy Finkel. She's said to be not a very good dancer. She represents the Coral Sea. Arista, the fifth sister. She is a sweet-natured and musically gifted sister who can play the trombone and loves to perform. She represents the White Sea. And yes, because of Caucasian New Christianity, thinking they're pure as white as snow, they made her hair blonde. Oh yes, and her eyes blue. <laughs> Adrena. The sixth sister. She's the funny one who likes humor, jokes, and sarcasm. She represents the Caribbean Sea. Ariel. Then finally, yes, we have Ariel, whom she represents the Red Sea, hence her hair. You see, the Red Sea borders Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Ethiopia, Cairo, Egypt, and so on. And we know the race these people were and mostly still are, don't we? Heck, all historic male and female superheroes were about black African men and women. No offense, Caucasians didn't have anything to fight for at that time, and not very much to fight for now. It was the other way around during the writing of this play in 1837. 
The Wonder Woman myth was based on the Amazonian women of Dahomey. The writer of Wonder Woman, William Marston, he was the creator of it. So he got the myth from the Amazon women of Dahomey. These women were the ones who beat the French. When the French went to Africa, these Amazon women beat the brakes off the French. The French had to go back to France and say, hey, look, we got beat by these women. And in order to justify it, they say, yeah, we got beat, but these women were 10 feet tall. They were huge. So the myth of the giant Amazon woman was born out of that. They moved that myth over to Greece, saying that the women were these big Greek women with superpowers. And so that's where Wonder Woman comes in. Now, the person who created Wonder Woman, William Marston, he was connected with Margaret Sanger in the eugenist movement. As a matter of fact, one of the women that William was dealing with was Olive Byrne, who was Margaret Sanger's cousin. And Margaret Sanger was the woman who created Planned Parenthood and eugenics, and she wanted to sterilize black women. So there's always that little connection there. With that said, that would mean the Ariel sisters should be black, colored, African or Hispanic, which means that the Little Mermaid wasn't changed from white misappropriated or whatever bull crap was said or white washing of Hollywood, heck, the world has been doing for centuries to Blacks, Africans, and Hispanics history. The Little Mermaid merely went back to its original roots. Deal with it. White culture, if you could even call it culture, is based in racism. It was a narrative created by colonizers, like my Portuguese ancestors, in order to justify what they were doing to other people on the continent of Africa and even here in North America. And the narrative was that we white people were better than all other races. And they did so through Christianity. They took the Bible and different scripture verses, twisted it around in order to fit the narrative of colonialism and white supremacy and also the patriarchy. And the patriarchy is white man in power. White supremacy is white man in power. Colonialism is white man in power. And Christianity, for the most part nowadays, is white man in power. There are historical references and proof where the Catholic Church actually said to enslave an African was to save their soul. The kidnapped and enslaved Africans that were here in North America were preached different scripture verses than were actually in the Bible. And that's why they weren't allowed to read. Because if they could read, then they could see that these scripture verses were incorrect and they couldn't be controlled anymore by this white God. Yes. And white people, we didn't identify as white until colonialism. We identified as Portuguese or Latvian or German or Italian or French. Mm -hmm. But then colonialism came around and then all of a sudden we became white and we were superior because we were the chosen race by god and the scripture verses proved it and we had to go into other people's lands and preach the gospel when really it was all a ruse it was all an excuse to go in and rape and pillage the land and the people and the cultures so when i say that white culture is based in racism it is it's based in racism Christianity was the Trojan horse of white supremacy and colonialism. And Western Christianity, as we know today, is still based within superiority. Correct. All Christians think that they're better than everybody else. I grew up in it. I'm very familiar with the culture. Yes. And it's part of the problem. There's a reason why most of Trump supporters are Christians. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's because they don't even realize that the conditioning of colonialism and Christianity and the patriarchy is so deeply embedded within them and their identity that they don't even see the truth. Yeah. Christianity is based in superiority, in white superiority, in white culture, which is all based in racism. Yeah.